Okay, tonight we're going to continue our series on codependency, and we started last week by basically defining codependency and what codependency is. And remember, I gave a simple definition. I define codependency as any person, place, or thing that I've built a dependency on that makes my life unmanageable or makes my life crazy. I said that could be a substance, that could be a person, that could be a job, that could be a family, that could be a lot of different things. The key is depend dependency and unmanageability. Now tonight what I want to do basically is talk about the foundations of codependency and talk about something called family systems. And I'll kind of take you on kind of a journey of that tonight and hopefully it'll help you to take a look at your own family systems and how they affect you and how the process goes through. I kind of have a nickname for this lecture. I call it what is normal? And the bottom line is very simple. There really is no real normal. Normal is something that changes daily. It's a constant process. And we have the right, and I'll emphasize this to the best of my ability, we have a right to create a normal that is healthy for us. I've said this so many times, there are two words I recommend before you leave tonight that you drop into the trash can on the way out. The words are right and wrong. I call them judgment words. We have to learn something. Each one of us has to go on a journey of finding out what's healthy and what's normal for us. We have to find out what works. Even the big book of AA tells us that. It says, everything is suggested, be open to the process, take what you can use, and leave the rest. When we talk about families, we go back and look at where many of our normals came from. Now, last week I mentioned to you that at the moment of your birth, when you come into the world, you actually, without even knowing it, enter and join what I call five family systems, automatically. The minute you come out of your mother, you're a member of five families immediately. The blood family, and that family could be an extended family also. Your neighborhood, your cultural or your environment family. You also become a member of a religious family system or a non-religious family system based on what your family system happens to be. Or you, you become part of a peer family. And finally, you become part of a media family, society, radio, television, advertising. And basically, our whole entire family systems affect us and develop normals for us, even though those normals may not really be who we are. But we kind of pick them up, and they become our normal from the environment and the things that we're around. And so it's kind of interesting when you look at this, because I mentioned last week, if you go back and you actually take the time to go back and look at the first 10 years of your life, you'll find out everything about you. Why you act the way you act, why you function the way you function, why you behave the way you behave. And so many of our so-called normals come from our patterns and things we developed in the early age of our growth process. But remember, I'm not just talking about blood family. I'm talking about all these family systems. I'll give you some examples. Let's begin with the family of origin. If you take a minute and look back on your own journey, you realize the fact that and you look at your particular family of origin, many of us learned certain rules, concepts, and guidelines from our family systems. I joke a lot even about my own, but I learned some very powerful, powerful messages from my wonderful, fantastic Italian family. For example, from my mother I learned, be scared and be afraid of everything. Rules like, don't go out and play, you might get hurt. Don't breathe, you might get hurt. Don't function, you might get hurt. So as a result, the aspect of protection so many times can be very dysfunctional, and what it does is it creates fear in your life. So what do you do? You go through life constantly expecting something to happen, but you go through life in that constant process of fear. And so many times we have rules and regulations, and I still joke about them today. For example, I, I come from the 40s. I mean, my first 10 years of my life were from 1940 to 1950. And my mother used to say this to me all the time. She taught me to be scared to death to fly. The rule was, if God wanted you to fly, 
God will give you wings. See how simple it is? And believe it or not, I actually had a fear of flying on an airplane until I was 48 years old. I took my first flight. And today, I do a lot of flying. I was able to change my normal. But even that first flight, there's still that little scare. And once in a while, when I walk down that runway, I can expect my mother to be standing there, <laughs> getting ready to yell at me and scream at me. It's funny how we set patterns inside of ourselves. And we, we realize these little tapes play inside of our heads. It's totally amazing. One of the classic ones many of us heard from plenty of the old timers were, make sure you always have clean underwear. God forbid you get into an accident. It's okay if you're dead, as long as mom's not embarrassed because your underwear's not clean. It's totally amazing. But it's amazing where some of these concepts and guidelines and things come from. And again, this is not about bad-mouthing them. It's just the stuff they were raised with, and they pass it on. Their vision of life was totally different than our vision of life. They became our normal after a period of time. So we learn all these rules, all these concepts. You know, so you pick up different things and different patterns and different ways in which we raise as children. You look back on that because you realize that they're coming out of their patterns also. And their patterns, let's face it, in my generation anyway, they're coming out of two world wars, they're coming out of depression, they're coming out of all kinds of crazy stuff. So as a result, they definitely had fears. And many of those fears were passed on. And so literally what happens very many times you go back and do an inventory of your family systems you realize the fact that you pick up certain patterns. One of the things I still joke about today, I was never allowed to ride a bicycle when I was a kid. I learned to ride a bike when I was 51 years old. You got to visualize the scene. A very good friend of mine who was the chief of police in my town, my wife actually videoed this. He, had, he was holding the back seat of the bike, running me down the street, <laughs> teaching me how to ride a bicycle. You know, 51 years old. He was 56, having a great time out there. What can I tell you? And I joke about it today because I ride my bike every day now. I love it. But it's just those little fears, those things, and especially guilt. I will never forget so many times how guilt was used to control, to manipulate, to literally keep things under control. My mother, my mother almost died on the operating table when I was born. And I still can hear my aunt saying to me, you almost killed your mother once. You better be good or you'll kill her again. And you don't realize how these tapes stick in your head. They become part of you after a while. Even customs and patterns and things of that effect, they all have an effect on you. They have an effect on your concept. Same thing as regards neighborhood, cultural, environment, family. Even in our country, let's face it, if you mention certain places, there's a certain mentality that goes along with it. For example, I can say South Philly. And right away, and many of us, there's a stereotype about South Philadelphia. It's actually a separate state from the Union, but that's all right. But the concept is, there's this whole process that goes on. We can mention things like West Philly or North Philly or different aspects. And it's almost like there's always this kind of image and things that goes along with it. The Midwest, the West Coast. And it's almost like people even act differently in different areas and different places. They often say people on the East Coast are crazier than people on the West Coast. But who knows? But it's all, all based on perception and how we see things. But again, we pick up normals and different aspects and different concepts. Just to give you an example, I was given a talk at one of the rehabs. I happened to mention that I was born and raised in Camden, New Jersey. Everybody in the place looked at me with these eyes. Because to them, Camden was their place they copped their drugs. To me, it was a beautiful place in which I was raised. See how perception works? It all comes down to what was normal for you and your growth process and what went on in your life. Same thing we talk about cultural environment neighborhoods, all those things affect us, affect our growth process. I can still remember in growing up as a child, we lived in the Italian neighborhoods in Camden. And we used to be told over and over again, you don't go anywhere unless you're with an Italian. 
The other neighborhoods, I don't know what they were. We weren't allowed to go there. And still, there was the old rule. My cousin had the audacity to actually date an Irish girl. Then he married her. The sad part about it is his mother cut him off from the family for almost 10 years. As far as she was concerned, her son was dead because he married outside the system. And we don't realize how many times, if you look at your own history, how so many of these little rules and concepts and guidelines play in the back of your head. You're supposed to do certain things at a certain time because that's the custom. You're supposed to act a certain way in certain places because that's the custom. And so any time we begin to do something differently, very many times our systems, our family systems, can get very upset at us. Many of us have seen this, especially getting into recovery. We get into recovery and very many times members of our family think something's wrong with us because they're used to us functioning a certain way. They're used to us acting a certain way. And the minute you start to make those changes, it's amazing how people get nervous and they get upset. Why? Because you're actually kind of forcing them to look at themselves in their own patterns. I always tell the story of my uncle, who's now in his 90s. But I still can remember, you know, I used to weigh close to 300 pounds at one time when I was in my active addiction. And I can still remember going to visit my uncle recently, and he looks at me today and he says to me, are you dying of cancer? You look terrible. You used to look nice. Why don't you come over our house and let my wife give you a good meal? It's obvious your wife isn't visiting you and isn't feeding you. You see what I'm trying to say? So as a result then, it's almost like I'm used to you being a certain way. If you're not that way, there must be something wrong with you. That can be physically, emotionally, spiritually. Even our belief systems come into play with that because so many of us were caught up in different belief systems. You know, growing up as a kid in Camden, you know, again, being raised in the Italian Catholic school system. I mentioned this so many times. I had some very interesting ladies called nuns that literally put the fear of God into me, put the fear of God into all the kids, and look at normals. In the late 40s and the 50s, if sister beat you half to death in the classroom, it was perfectly okay. Today, she'd be arrested for child abuse. See how normals change over the course of time? And so really, in reality, we learn different concepts in different directions. You pick them up from different systems. Some of the old systems, even when it came to our concept or our vision of God, God was this person that was out to get you. As a result then, in recovery today, we're allowed to create a normal that works for us. Even our 12-step program tells us Develop a God of your understanding. You're allowed to create things that work for you, to work in new directions. And so many times, literally, the old tapes still play, the old concepts still play. They can drive you crazy after a while. When it comes to peers, it's amazing the powerful energy that children have on children. And even on us as adults, so many times we're constantly doing things we don't really want to do because we're worried about what will somebody else think. We're constantly looking at what other people think of us and we're constantly putting ourselves into that bind and that craziness and that insanity. And it's scary because literally what we're doing over and over again is we're constantly living our life based around what other people want us to be. And peer pressure is probably one of the most powerful systems there is for kids as well as for adults. And finally, media. It's amazing when you look back into your own life. You know, one of the things I was doing today, I was listening on that XM radio to Radio Classics. And I was listening to some of the programs from way back. You know, they had the famous uh, Lou Abbott Buck, Buck Costello program on air. They have all the old timers, Jack Benny, everything else. It was great to listen to it all. But it's almost like I grew up in an age in the 40s where radio was the center of everything. 
So the first TV didn't come out to the late 40s. So the concept was, your way in which you grow up, even your, your concept society, basically we were limited to the amount of messages that were given to us. Today, children growing up today are bombarded by thousands and thousands and thousands of messages via the internet, via computers, via everything else. It's just totally amazing. And so literally, our outside world, the messages, things of that effect, keep trying to tell us what's normal. Now here's the key. We have the power to create a normal that works for us. We have the power to change. I've said this so many times, and I believe it in my own journey and my own life. There are no absolutes. Everything in life is always in process. It's always changing. Anytime you find yourself locking yourself into an absolute, it has to always be this way. You're shutting your mind down. You're closing yourself off. You're not open to what I call the journey of life. There is so much to look at in life. And no matter what happens, every day we go through a change process. And so every day we're realizing more and more there are less and less absolutes. There's just that simple journey of life. And what's so beautiful about it, as I go through my changes and my growth process as a human being, I can make changes, I can look at things totally differently. And so your vision begins to change. I've said this so many times, if you're honest, if you're open, if you truly want to continue growing as a person, then literally, you're never done. I mentioned this to you before, and I say it as strongly as I can. When I was a priest, I spent a lot of time performing marriages. And I get two beautiful young people come up in front of me, and they say, I promise to love you the way I love you today until death do us part. That means I have to shoot them before they leave the altar. The minute they turn around and walk down that aisle, they've already changed. And as they go through the journey of their relationship, if it's a healthy relationship, it's going to continue to change. It's a constant process. There is no th such thing as it's going to always stay the same. Later on, if they have children, the invaders will come along. That's the children. It'll change the whole aspect of their relationship. Everything will be in process and changing. Then you'll have grandkids and great-grandkids. Next thing you know, you don't know who you are. It's a process. It's fun. It's what life is supposed to be. But see, if you actually try to lock yourself in to one particular normal, you'll spend your life being very frustrated, very uptight, always looking for the magical answer, when really, in reality, there are no answers. It's just life. And the secret we have to learn is how to be open to what I refer to as the process of life. As you grow in recovery, you also realize something else. Even your family structures begin to change. Remember, recovery is not even an absolute. In the big book of AA, they even tell you, take what you can use and leave the rest. They tell you to be open. They tell you progress, not perfection. They tell you to look at things in a positive way. They just give suggestions. Each one of our journeys, we can find different things from different places in different areas and different concepts to learn about ourselves as an individual. So if I'm healthy every day on a constant basis, I am developing new normals. So yes, Virginia, there is a normal. There's a normal that works for you and that's healthy for you today. And tomorrow, that normal may change. And so what happens to many of us as codependents, we have a hard time with this because we're looking for absolute answers. I always love that one. Everybody wants to have an answer. And I try to tell them over and over again, there aren't any. So what do I do very many times? I literally tell them to be open to the process. And I joke about this, but it's part of my own life. I often say that when I, I remember when I was 20 years old. I really was 20 at one time. It's amazing. I had all the answers. 
You couldn't tell me a damn thing when I was 20 years old. Then I got to 30. I discovered all the questions. Then I got to 40 and I found out there weren't any answers. Then I got to 50 and I didn't care. Then I got to 60 and let it all hang out. Now in my 70s, you gotta, you got to be kidding me. Now we go for the gold. Now you know why seniors have more fun. Because they don't worry about how they look. Just a matter of the more important thing is to wake up in the morning. The more important thing is to read the obituary column and find out your name's not in it. And that's exciting. It's this process of learning about yourself as a person. You begin to see things through a different set of eyes as you look at the world through a different set of eyes. So you see things from a totally different perspective. And you don't take life so serious anymore. See, we drive ourselves. And here's the thing I really want to bring out tonight because so many of us, because of these so-called mini-traumas, things that occur to us through our family systems, these rules, these concepts, these guidelines, so many of us so many times are scared to death of that wonderful, fantastic, magic word. And the word is change. Change is not a bad word. Change is a healthy word. And I guess I pray every day that I'll be in a constant process of changing all the time. I don't want to stay the same. Because if you do, you become stagnant. You become bored. Life is supposed to be an adventure. And so the more you open yourself up, and that comes with experience, that comes with time, that comes with literally going through your own struggles, your own discoveries, things that happen to you in your life. I truly believe that every experience that we've all gone through in the course of our journey in life will one day be our strength if we're able to face it and learn from it. No matter what the tragedy is, no matter what the hurt is, no matter what the pain is, no matter what we've gone through, somehow, some way, there is another side to it if we can get to the other side. I say this over and over again. For every negative, there is a positive. Like my father used to say when I was a kid growing up, you know, I call him the old philosopher with a second grade education from the old wonderful city of Camden. He used to say to me in his old Italian accent, Vinzi, you don't know what it is to get up until you fall down. Don't be afraid to fall down because then you will get up. See how it works? And yes, think of that simple statement. It's what it's all about. Then my seven-year-old grandson said it even better. It was pouring rain. It was cloudy out. And I, I was kind of bitching a little bit because it was kind of a miserable day. And my seven-year-old grandson said, don't worry, Papa. The sun's still shining on the other side. Isn't it amazing sometimes out of the mouths of all different types of individuals and people, you can begin to see how things work for you, how special they are, how powerful they are? and realize the fact that that's what it's really all about. It's that constant process of learning. And I really believe the higher power speaks to us through the people we're in contact with on a daily basis. That things happen in our life to teach us something about ourselves. That we have to go through hell to get to heaven. My concept. We've got to go through struggle to get to the other side. Now along with this with codependency, there are two wonderful, fantastic games that codependents love to play. I kind of want to share them with you. And many of us learn them from our family systems. One is called the blame game. By the way, it's a wonderful, wonderful, fantastic game. I'll tell you why. Isn't it fun to blame everybody else for what's going on in our life? Isn't that fantastic? Isn't it fun to be able to say that my life is miserable because of the government? My life is miserable because of who I'm living with? God, it's a lot of fun. You never have to take responsibility. It's so much more fun to blame somebody else. And codependents are good at this. Aren't we good at checking out what's wrong with the other person so we can fix them and save them and take care of them? Don't you realize what you're doing? It's amazing some of the crazy stuff that we do. Because we feel this drive inside of us that it's because of you my life is miserable. 
I got to tell you a big secret tonight. Promise me you won't tell anybody, okay? There is no such thing as blame. We are responsible for our own journey. I am responsible for me. If I'm unhappy, it's because I am unhappy. It's not because of somebody else. And yet, so many times we have a tendency to pass the buck on to someone else, nor is it as my job to decide how somebody else is going to live. It's not my job to decide what's best for somebody else. I know as a priest, I played that game for a lot of years, a lot of years. And I still share that with you all the time. I look back on my own journey. I'm going back to 1966 when I was ordained a Catholic priest. And I made a decision when I got ordained. I decided the whole world was sick and I wasn't. That's a wonderful codependent decision. It was my job to save them. See how to work that? So from 1966, and oh, by the way, I don't need any help. From 1966 to 1972, I gave it one hell of a shot. <coughs> that ended me up in a psychiatric hospital with a nervous breakdown. That took care of that job. Now, as a result of that, I also learned how to beat myself up, how to be hard on myself, and drive myself crazy. Isn't that amazing, some of the crazy stuff that we do? What I realized today, I literally was running around the countryside trying to fix everybody, save everybody, rescue everybody, but I forgot somebody. I forgot me, because I didn't count. And here's the scariest thing for many of us. So many of us are so busy taking somebody else's inventory, figuring out why they should be the way they should be, when really, in reality, we should be home looking in a mirror and working on ourselves. Yes, I can make suggestions, but I cannot decide for another human being. There's the old phrase, I can lead a horse to water, I can shove the horse's head into the water, but I can't make the horse drink the water. That's the horse's decision. See the concept? And we are the exact same way. There's so much we have to learn. I remember my wonderful codependency. When I was doing my training and my internship at a rehab in Philadelphia called DRC, Diagnostic Rehabilitation Center. And I was really excited, you know, to be working with people. Although I always want to fix alcoholics, no problems at all. So literally, what a hell of a codependent. So I had this lady in a room who had a drug, an alcohol and drug problem, and I decided that she was going to detox. And guess what? She was not getting out of that room until she went to detox. And I was driving that poor lady crazy. My teacher and wonderful mentor, Jack Roke, knocked on the window, and he said to me, come here. I went over and he whispered in my ear, the lady wants to drink, leave her alone. I thought that was terrible. I mean, what do you mean she wants to drink? We have to make her get well. Maybe I should get a stick and beat her a few times so she finally gets well. But literally, and Jack kept saying to me, the lady wants to drink. Leave her alone. And I'll tell you, I looked at him and said, what kind of a treatment center is this? You're actually letting her leave and go out of here? And Jack kept saying, it's her choice. And I kept saying, no, we've got to fix her. And I know how much that got me into a lot of trouble even into my eating disorder and everything else. It drove me crazy. Because I was so driven, driven, and driven. And codependency does that to you. The other disease that goes along with codependency is the one of the disease called the splain game. The splain game. Or I call it the disclosure game. It's like we have to explain everything when nobody asks us for an explanation. I love it. It's almost as if I got to make everybody okay. I want them to understand. 
So what do I do? And a lot of this stuff comes, once again, from our family structure, things in which we grew up in, rules we learned, and concepts and guidelines. It's all part of our growth process as human beings. And the explain game is a wonderful game. It's insane. What am I doing? I have to make everybody understand who I am and what I'm all about. I drive myself crazy. And the explain game is crazy. People come up to me and they say, you want to come to my party on Friday night? You don't want to go to their party on Friday night. But what do you say? Oh, sure. Then you've got to go home, and when Friday comes, you call them up and say, I would really love to be at your party, but the carburetor blew on my car, and I can't get there. Next thing you know, somebody comes and picks you up. You've got to be careful. It's totally amazing. Crazy stuff that we do. We're always trying to make excuses, make stories up, do different types of things, because we don't know how to say what I call the two magic words. We don't know how to say yes or no. We have to give a two-hour explanation with each one. It's that self-disclosure thing again. Now, you walk down the street, and your neighbor is just being nice, and he says to you, hi. How are you? You do a fifth step with them. You scared the guy half to death. He's ready to run out of the neighborhood. You wonder why his house is up for sale the next day. I'm living next to this nut. You got to be crazy. All he said was hi. But see, we have this fixation sometimes. We have to explain everything to everybody. Why? Because I want them to like me. I want them to be on board. I want them to understand when they don't have to understand. And one of the hardest things for us to say is the word no without an explanation. You know, we, we're scared. We're scared. We're scared of criticism. We're scared nobody's going to like us. We're scared that we're not going to be able to get a point through. We're scared of a lot of things. And that fear drives you crazy a lot of times. You know, we have to learn the importance of what I call clarity, making things clear and not muddy in the waters by working on these gigantic explanations. And yet, what's it come from? Insecurity, no real sense of myself. So as codependents, a lot of times we get caught up in this. It becomes almost a normal to us after a while. Somebody says hi, you have to talk to them for half an hour. Just say hi back. Keep it simple. But it's all part of the process we go through. So as a result, you know, even sometimes what do we do to other people? I came into the room, I sat down. How come you're not talking to me? Do I have to talk to you? <laughs> well, did I do something wrong? Did something happen? How come you're quiet? Maybe it's just because I want to be quiet? Oh, no. We've got to be able to talk about something. Let's talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Let's talk about it anyway. You know, sometimes with our codependency behavior patterns, we can drive people crazy and we drive them nuts. But again, where does it come from? It comes from our personal insecurities. It comes from the fact that we keep searching for answers to things that don't need answers. We don't realize the fact that it's just the journey of life. And sometimes people are upset at us. They're allowed to be. Later on, they'll get okay. The other thing we have a hard time with as codependents sometimes is making decisions. Not about others, but making them about ourselves. We have a really hard time making decisions about ourselves, especially when it comes to doing something nice for ourselves. See, it's amazing. I told you the story about the lady that approached me after a lecture. And I've known this lady for almost 10 years. Came up to me and she said, Vince, I found the perfect program. I said, tell me about it. I'm going to go to this intensified program for 14 days. They're going to work on me and they're going to help me to solve all these things. I said, how much is the program? She said, $9,000. I said, ma'am, come here. I said, why don't you go on a cruise to Europe 
and go enjoy yourself instead of analyzing yourself to death. And what do we do as codependents? I got news for you. We are a therapist. They love us. They can't wait till we come to them for therapy. That means we'll be there for the next 48 years. It's not a problem. Because we're going to constantly try to find something to work on. Got something more to work on. Got to work on this, got to work on that. Let me tell you a secret. You can analyze yourself till 10 days after your day, you still find something to work on. So we're, we're, we're human beings. Come on, give a break. Do the best you can and keep it that simple. Now, what I really want to just bring out tonight is that we basically have developed certain patterns in our life. We have to learn those patterns are part of who we are. And they'll be part of who we are till 10 days after we're dead. Now, I have a choice. I can face them, embrace them, learn from them. I can't change them, but I can adjust them positively. I can adjust them positively. As a result then, literally, I'll be able to look at them through a different set of eyes. I can make changes in my life today. I am the architect of my journey. And therefore, I have the right to make changes. I can develop new normals and things that work for each and every one of us on a journey. That's the responsibility we have as a person. So when we talk about what is normal, we're talking about the concept of being able to take the time to invest in ourselves and take the time to realize the fact that we are allowed to make changes so we can continue our growth process as a human being. Now, one thing I want to kind of do with you is we're going to spend some time taking this to another dimension next week. And next week, I want to talk about one of my favorite lectures on how to play and how to have fun, how to kind of loosen up a little bit. We'll see what happens. But I'll tell you a secret. Codependence in adult children take life very, 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 very seriously. They take life so seriously. That's why they're on duty 24 hours a day and seven days a week. I've often said, addicts are smarter than codependents. Codependents are on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Addicts at least get drunk once in a while and forget about it. Not the codependent, no. I gotta be ready to go 24 hours a day. We're the only ones who wake up and we're on a project. Did you ever see a codependent watch TV? I love it. We got 58 projects around them they have to work on. They can't just sit there and watch the show. They gotta get something done. They gotta accomplish something constantly. Then they walk around saying things like, I'm so tired, I'm exhausted, I never get any rest, I never do this. You wanna smack them across the head and say, come on, will you go sit in a chair and relax? But they can't sit in a chair and relax. That's called wasting time. So loosen up a little bit, relax, chill. So we're gonna do some things next week to help you change some patterns in your life. So I'm gonna ask you, when you come to the session next week, I want you to bring with you your favorite stuffed animal. Now if you don't have one, you're a deprived child, congratulations. I have about 25 of them I'll bring, put up here, and basically you can pick one and play with it next week and see what happens. I mean, everybody should have a stuffed child, it's a stuffed animal. So bring one next week, okay? And also, when you come next week, we're gonna do some crazy stuff and have some fun and loosen up. Now, do me a favor. Don't call me this week and say, I don't have a stuffed animal. Can I come to the lecture? Yes, you can come to the lecture. You don't have to go to build a bear and create one. You don't have to spend all that time. Just bring you, you can be the stuffed animal. I'll have some fun with it, okay? We'll also learn some things next week. We're going to learn, you know, how to be able to loosen up, how to meet the other side of ourself, how to be able to meet the part of us that many of us run away from because adult children and codependents are extremely, extremely predictable because so many times we're rigid. We have to learn how to break that pattern and meet the other part of ourself. So we'll have some fun next week and see what happens with it. So next week we'll continue with that program on how to play and how to have fun. 
The week after that, we'll do codependency and relationships. And the week after that, we'll do codependency and the roles that codependents play. Then in the last four weeks, we'll, take, we'll go through the six stages of recovery from codependency, take through the whole process and show you how it works. Okay?